Nobody's born incredible. People who do incredible things simply took the right steps. This is our journey. This is the hunt for incredible. This is part two where we talk to Christian Osgood about how to acquire multifamilies with little to no money down and no experience. I hope you enjoy it. You don't mind me d- directing the interview a little bit or the podcast a little bit. Yeah, take it. Um, I hear too many people in real estate, they find a strategy and they fall in love with it and they go, that's the strategy. People need to keep deal debt equity in mind. Like deal is the opportunity in front of you. If I was to, because I watched a lot of bigger pockets. If I was to watch bigger pockets when I was getting started, I would have been, okay, I need to house hack a fourplex. That is the right. best thing that I can do. And I would only be looking at fourplexes that could be house hacked. And I would be waiting between deals to reset my financing. Instead of going, my goal is to own multifamily real estate. How would one do that? And then I look at all the multifamily real estate. And all of a sudden we found a 38 unit opportunity that we could buy with or without money. That If I did not do that, that would be another... I mean, well, that'd be a million dollars of net worth in that deal that'd be gone. But it also, that set me up for everything else that happened after, which was also millions of dollars. I would have missed out in a two-year period of three to $4 million of legitimate net worth building business if I was only focused on one strategy. You find the opportunity that is unique to you and you pursue it. I just did an interview on our YouTube channel, Cody and Christian Multifamily Strategy. I did that with um, that ADU guy, an awesome guy named Derek. He found his simple, boring, repeatable thing in ADUs. And he was super passionate about it, super obsessed with it. He found that opportunity. I think he was, was one of his wood shop teachers in high school. So like almost 30 years ago. The opportunity in front of him was, he's like, oh, I wanted to do stuff in like building. I wanted to build cabins. Well, if he only focused on building cabins, he'd, he'd be some cabin builder who like, you know, didn't do probably all that much. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. found that you can do something similar uh, just with the way zoning was in this community he was in, where it's all of a sudden like he has had a very, very, very entertaining, fun, successful career because he took the opportunity instead of deciding, hey, this is the only thing I'm doing. So very wordy, but long story short, like, hey, if, if there's one strategy you love, your adventure is not going to look like the person online's adventure. The, the person who you want to learn from and copy, take the best from what they're doing, but look at your pieces and what's in front of you and build a business around that. For me, yeah. 38 Plex set me up. That was what we were best at. And it happened to be doing an excellent renovation on well-priced, low-income housing. And we got really stupid good at it. It's not what I was looking for, but it's what we found. And it's been an amazing journey. So... If you are looking for your thing, it's probably right in front of you. Yeah. And maintaining that curiosity, like that childlike curiosity of, oh, like, how does this work? I go, if I, if I did, if I did take a closer look at this property that's been sitting on the market for 15 years, if I did make that work, what what would that look like? And then seeing like, oh, I, I actually could implement these pieces that other people didn't feel like executing or the same thing with, with how I got in the game of like, oh. I need a place to crash when I'm visiting family for the holiday, buying a fourplex, putting it on Airbnb and then saying like, oh, this thing actually works. Like just like leaving yourself open to the curiosity of, well, but what if I did this? It's like Robert Kiyosaki says, don't say I can't do something. Say, how can I do something? And then it totally shifts your perspective, putting on that different lens by which you look through at the world. It shifts everything. That is that is the only piece of creative finance. Like that is literally that's all you do, different from anything else. Is you just go, okay, this deal does not work. How would it work? What what could we do to make it work? And the simplest answer is the right answer every time. A great example. Uh, I have a, a mentee. His name's Caleb Hommel. I talk about him a lot. Uh, we've had a lot of successful people. He just happens to be the most successful. He came up with something we call it the Hommel Act. Now he had a deal that violated the rule that doesn't cash flow day one. And it had, um, it had some renovation, but he had $300 in his bank account. He just negotiated. He's like, what is the simplest answer? He's like, well, if I didn't have to pay the mortgage, it would cash flow amazingly. I was like, well, yeah. He's like, so um, he's like, I just negotiated. We closed and the mortgage starts getting paid. I like the payments start in six months. They're not deferred. They don't accrue. It's just, we give you a down payment up front, And then I in six that. months, I've saved all this money and it starts my renovations and it gives me time to increase rent. He solved for long-term cash flowing fixed rate debt by just saying like, okay, it works as long as I don't pay a mortgage for a certain period of time. 
such a good strategy. I use it on hotel conversions. When we buy hotels, we're going to convert to multifamily. You have to empty the building, which means you have to, like, you don't have income. There's no way you cash flow on no income. So we just made it where it's like, okay, we're going to limit our expenses by saying we're not paying the mortgage because we're doing this conversion. And we need three to six months of no mortgage payments. And, and like simplest answer is always the best answer. How would I do it? You find an answer and then you just go, okay, how do we put this on paper? Easiest thing in the world, but that's, that's what creative finance is. If you try to get super complicated, your deal will fall apart or you're going to try to report something on your taxes and it's going to be like, oh shoot, didn't think about this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've had that happen too. So keep it simple. Keep it, uh, keep it easy. Ask the Kiyosaki question. How would I do this? And if you're the one to answer that question, you're the one who gets to make the money on the deal. A hundred percent. And also if the rules are based on what you and the other person agree to, then they're malleable. Like I, I always say that, like if you're, if you're talking to somebody else and you two are like playing by the rules of the game and you two are the only ones who have decided those rules, then the rules are malleable. I think oftentimes people go into something thinking, okay, this is how properties are purchased traditionally. And so these are the steps you take. And it's like you, you hop on this train and it takes you down the track. And once you get to the end of the stop, hopefully if you get to the end of the stop, you have a property. But that's not what it is. You're literally like, it's more like you're building a bridge with somebody else and you can sit down and say, no, that piece won't work for me. What about this other one? And they say, oh, okay. And you're like, oh, you know what? It's actually not going to cash flow until six months in. So what do you say to no payments for six months? You know, it's like you're you're like agreeing to something and understanding someone else's pain points and solving their problem while presenting your own so that you can come up with a solution. And the rules are so much fuzzier and, and more malleable than most people think. You can literally create whatever you want, like purchasing properties. You're just agreeing to a contract. Sure, you have like, you know, like there's the whole legal system and there are deeds and there are some things that are concrete, but outside of some very basic fundamental components, everything is malleable. Yeah. So for creative finance, if you and the other party can solve all of your problems with what you negotiate and the lawyers can sign off on the paperwork, you're done. Like any, that's a beautiful thing with contracts. You get what you negotiate. If you don't like something, change it. It's not that hard. There's very few things you can't do. Like there's some laws around, you know, certain things. But as long as your lawyer says you can and the IRS says you can, you can do almost anything on a piece of paper. And the beautiful thing is if you need to change something, uh, paperwork can also be changed. <laughs> a notary does not cost that much. Uh, anything can be negotiated. Creative finance, I mean, that's the rule. Solve their problem, solve your problem in the least amount of pieces. Have both parties' lawyers sign off on it and then sign it. You're done. Creative finance in uh, 10 seconds. Yeah, it's not as complicated as, as people make it oftentimes. No. Um, I do want to hear about the uh, the Robin Hood story and how you purchased that, and then we can dive into more of like the tools and tactics that people can use. Can you can you share that okay. story? Uh, Robin Hood Village Resort went into the initial meeting with the sellers. They're like, okay, well, you want to buy it? Um, how are you paying for this? Uh, I was like, oh, well, let me get the let me get the suitcase of money out of the car. Um, and they kind of laughed like, seriously, how, how do you want to put this together? And I was like, well, look, we're looking at a couple of opportunities in Central Washington. Um, it's going to be about a million dollars down. And that's about as much as we're capable of doing. And they're like, okay, so let's finance three and a half. I'm like, well, I'd really like to save some of that money for those acquisitions. So, I mean, if we can do like 400 down, that would be great. And they're like, well, we really like a million down. I was like, okay, darn it. I set the, I set the anchor in the wrong <laughs> spot. That's the, uh, that's what you get. So that was our deal. Um, we have three and a half million dollars at 4.5% on an eight year note. So the, wow. 3.5 out of four, uh, four and a half are now raised. The last million, uh, we have an investor who was looking for larger real estate projects to run a cost seg on. They are real estate professionals, so they can actually write off some of their active income uh, with a larger property. The first ones we went to, and this was wrong thinking by us, but we thought, okay, let's do, um, let's get like three maximum four investors to all bring in a quarter million to $350,000, wherever it lines up. Um, it's probably how many people it's going to take to get this raised. So the first person we pitched, we were like, they're like, what do you need? I was like, well, really, we're looking for a minimum investment of a quarter million dollars uh, from a few people. Um, seven minutes into the meeting, we said, hey, here's our project. Here's what we want to do. This is why we love it. Um, this is what we need. 
You're like, well, we're really more comfortable if we do all of it. If there's less partners, we're more comfortable. What would it look like for us to be the only partner? Uh, to which the answer is, well, it would look like a million dollars. <laughs> and they're like, okay, done. Uh, and that was it. Um, we came in. That was the partnership. It has a buyout agreement. So um, at the end of the eight-year term, we buy them out. And uh, that that that's the down payment. And the property will pay for the, da- the buyout. So the real estate buys the real estate. We had $0 invested in the deal. And um, yeah, we have 4.5% interest on... A majority of the money, very low interest rate on a great acquisition. We brought the income on that property, by the way, a uh, best year it had ever had in 89 years was 610, I believe it was $610,000. We brought the revenue on it year one to $723,000. So nice. Uh, and we made a lot of mistakes, like <laughs> a ludicrous amount of mistakes. We could do way better. So 2024 will have much better books than 2023. Um, but that is an example of a project where while we still paid a lot of stupid tax, we still did amazing on the project. And uh, that is how that capital raise went. It was literally $1 million in a seven minute conversation at a Starbucks next to my house. For a quarter million, they gave me a million. <laughs> Lesson, ask for what you want, not what you think you're going to get. We could have just asked them for a million and that would have been the better ask. That is called getting lucky. Like the fact that they're, they proposed, can we give more and have more? That structure, you, what you really want to do is just like, hey, I need a million dollars. You have four people lined up, ask each one for a million dollars. Then you have less partners and the you know, mm. deal's done. Um, we just did that on a hotel. I went to a lender and I said, hey, um, I would like it 100% financed. Like, I don't want to put any money in. We could, but I don't want to. And they're like, well, we're actually more comfortable if you have a little bit more liquidity. So can we actually, we're buying a hotel for a million six. They're like, can we lend you a million eight to start your project? I was like, yes, yes, you can. <laughs> um, so I'm buying a deal right now, a hundred, what is that? 115 ish. Some, yeah. some math person is going to hop on and be like, no, it's not. It's 117.5, whatever. <laughs> um, it's like 115% financed uh, thing. I asked for what I wanted and I got even better. But that's, that is the right thing to do. I think most people go to a lender and say, hey, can I get 80% LTV on this? I just come in and ask, like, look, this deal's stupid. It's a fantastic deal. 33 units, Washington State for a, a million six. It's going to be worth $3 million when it's done. Can we do this? And they're like, yes, and more. So that was the lesson from the Robin Hood. That's how that capital raise went. Um, those were simple and quick meetings. And again, the simplest answer was the easiest one. Just solving two people's problems. One, one group was trying to sell a hotel and they were okay with the terms. And another group was trying to get rid of a million dollars for some tax benefits and a handful of other things. And they just, you saw both of them. You're just, you're brokering yeah. so, problem solutions, matching them up. Yep. Easier, easier your solution is, the simpler it is to explain, the more often you're going to get a yes. You just make sure that it hits all their goals. And if their goals can't be hit within the rules of cash flow and long-term fixed rate debt, you just need to figure out, okay, how would we create a path to do that? Which could be like the Hommel hack that we talked about where it's like, well, I can't quite get you there immediately, but we're going to do a path. Or like say they want 7% interest, but the deal doesn't uh, afford that day one. Do a step up. Do like, oh, okay, well, look, it supports 3% interest day one, but you're not going to accept three. So let's do three for year one. And then we'll move to 5% in year two after we get rents up. And then when we finish our project, we'll bump up to seven. Like yeah. simple, easy things so that whatever they have, you can say yes to. Even if it's not yes right now, it's this is how I'm going to give you what you want. And boom, creative finance done. Right. Confused minds don't act 100%. Um, I know we spent that time in your story. I'd love to dive more into like the tools and techniques that people can actually like use getting down to the nuts and bolts of things. I know you stay hyper localized in the Washington state area. Now you are planning to migrate down to Texas. What does that look like? Are you going to start building a portfolio in Texas or are you going to stay hyper localized and just operate the acquisition and operation remotely? So I'm at, uh, so I've bought 18 units in Texas already. Um, I oh, move, nice. I move quickly when I want to do stuff. So I own, uh, right now we started, the opportunities were in the border towns for what I found. So I have, uh, I have 10 units in McAllen. I have eight units in Laredo, Texas. Um, there's some other stuff I'm working on. Um, I'm actually going to, we're, we'll expand that portfolio very, 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 very quickly. Um, there's a reason I have smaller deals down there is because there's bigger stuff in the works. Um, 
but hyper local is the way to do things. Uh, one one thousand um, percent. When you choose a market, double, triple, quadruple down in that area. There are so many cost saving efficiencies of having a property manager you trust, a lawyer that you trust, a maintenance team that you trust. It is hard to set that up everywhere and do a good job. If the goal is to be the best, you need to be the best. You have to control your market. And so that is what we're doing. Um, we did it in Washington. Uh, the properties that I had outside of that, my first duplex was in a city called Bremerton. Um, it's on the, like the very, very, very uh, west coast of Washington. The rest of my portfolio is in central Washington. I also have a sevenplex in Seattle. I'm selling the duplex and the sevenplex. I hate selling buildings, but I'm selling those because they don't fit the hyper local model. They're outliers and I don't have all of my great efficiencies. So once you choose your area and you start getting traction, focus on that area until you're big enough to control things. I will do that in new areas, but it's the same thing. It's like we need to have big teams, lots of efficiencies and a very stable portfolio before we look for a new market. What do you say to people who lean more heavily to the strategy of mitigating risk versus like location diversification? Oh, yeah. Warren Buffett quotes perfect on this. Instead of like, hey, uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket, uh, put everything in one basket and watch that basket really closely. Like mm. control your stuff. Like you cannot, you lose control with diversification. And I'm not saying don't diversify. I'm saying people diversify too soon. Mm. I'm going to use a sports analogy and I don't do a lot of these because I don't do a lot of sports. <laughs> um, I play pickleball, but um, football analogy, you would not spend all of your time on defense if you haven't scored a touchdown yet. Like when you need to score, you don't run down the clock and try to burn the other team's timeouts and all the other stuff you do. If you're behind, you have nothing to protect. Go score on offense. And that looks like building a portfolio that is stable and you don't have to be fully optimized. You have four business cycles, uh, build, stabilize, optimize, and then pay down the debt. If, if you haven't stabilized yet, what the heck are you protecting? Like, right. oh, I'm trying to mitigate my risk. I'm like, on what? Have you built what you want to build? Most people are trying to do this when like before they bought their first duplex. Like, okay, I want to buy this. And then, then my next property is going to be over here. I'm like, so you've now diversified and protected a $2,000 a month income stream of a couple properties. Yeah, yeah. You're still one lawsuit away from being wiped off the planet financially. It's like... It does not protect you. Build a business that is big enough to protect and then play defense. And there's other ways to play that too. Um, diversification is awesome. It is a wealth protection strategy. If you're not wealthy, focus on building your wealth, not protecting your wealth. Yeah. The, the same can be said about the often misunderstood quote around wealthy people have more than seven streams of income. And then you see these people trying to build wealth by building seven streams of income simultaneously. <laughs> it's like, no, just like focus on one thing, really fucking nail that one thing. And then once you mm -hmm. have that strong foundation, you have like the steady cash flow, then you diversify into multiple streams of income, which often looks like they're taking that capital that they made, like all that money that they made, and they're investing it in different areas and then getting income in those different areas, but they didn't start off with those seven streams of income. The seven streams of income is a byproduct of them being wise with the wealth that they amassed. It's not how they actually amassed that wealth. You're starting to see a lot of this on social media too, where like people who have not built their business are driving a sports car and a jet because they're like, the rich people have these things and they're write-offs. It's like, you don't have anything to write off and you're not rich. <laughs> Yeah. You don't start at the end. You start at the beginning. It's that is build a stable, strong, and again, like we've said throughout this whole thing, it's, it's that... It's that simple, boring, repeatable thing that you're really, really good at. You build that and then you add your features. You add diversity or you take a model that's worked and then you can move it to a new market. Um, but yeah, diversification or any of these things, you don't, you start with the end in mind. You don't start at the end. Right. You start at the beginning. A lot of people see the success and they go, I want to be there. And so they try to skip to the end. That's not what it looks like. You nailed on the head. Seven streams of income or whatever it is that the rich have. They have that because they one at a time built very stable, very well structured streams of income. And they've now had a need for new businesses or new write offs or whatever it is. You build that over time. You don't start by playing defense. You start by playing offense. Um, you, defense is super important. You just can't win a game without scoring. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> keep that in mind when you get started. Yeah, 100%.
So we've talked about leveraging seller finance, which is really great in these high interest rate environments because there's not as much movement and sellers often don't want to compromise on price. So there's a lot of flexibility to say, okay, if you sell our finance and with the interest rates, we'll get you, you know, to this amount or whatever it is. And so I've noticed that it seems that sellers are more open to these creative deal structures in these high interest rate environments. We've also talked about starting with the deal first and figuring out the financing after that. How do you anticipate the environment to acquire properties is going to change as the interest rates go back down and there's more movement in the market. Do you do you feel like the same tools will apply or do you feel like they'll be adjusted in some way? When I started investing, interest rates for houses were like 3%. And while I've my, like at the peak of our growth thus far, which we, we're not even close to peaking, but at like the peak of our momentum, rates got all the way up to like, they're they're getting around 8%. I mean, it was getting high. Um, I've bought deals. The, the most debt I've ever taken on, I've taken on 18% interest debt to buy a deal. Like I, I have notes between three and 18%. Um, we keep the rules the same. You fix your rates, you buy for cash flow. If it cash flows and supports the debt, that, I mean, that's all that matters. The numbers just need to work. So in that example, I have three to 18% debt and all of those deals work. Um, I'm going to say that generally speaking, rates are going to stay between three and 18. So I'll be able to do the same <laughs> things that I've been able to do. Um, the strategy doesn't care about the market. And it comes down to that long term cash flowing fixed rate debt. Mm -hmm. uh, the late, main thing being long term and fixed rate. You buy things where they work and you write them in a way where they don't change. On every property over the uh, forever, because we print money too fast. Pricing on everything goes up, which means your rent will go up. But if your rate stays the same and you owe the same amount, you're basically fixing your expenses and then you let time increase your incomes and everything does better and better and better. Creative finance, you're solving their problem, your problem. You just write deals that work under those rules and you do it again and again and again. So I do not care about market interest rates or conditions at all as long as the, uh, as long as the term on my debt is long enough. So, so you've commented on this a, a couple different ways, but I think it's it's worth really diving into of basically simplifying real estate, which is what you're phenomenal at, and breaking it down into effectively two simple parts, right? There's part one, which is acquiring the asset, and then there's part two, which is stabilizing it, making sure that you don't lose that asset. Would you mind elaborating on those two components and how you think of those two things? So on those two things, and it... Again, there are four full phases of real estate, but the, the first two are the ones where you get to like cash flow and keep the real estate. So, so we'll talk about the, the build and uh, build phase where you where you're buying the asset and stabilization where you're stabilizing it. So, you have two questions: buy and hold real estate can be re redefined as uh, how do I own it and how do I never lose it. Like if you can do those two things, congratulations, you can now buy and hold. Um, a lot of people focus on the buy and they don't focus on the hold. And those are the people who you see constantly flipping properties and they give themselves a job. They go, I have all this upside. I can get money, but I don't know how to hold things. So you have people who can buy without the second half. So question one, how do I buy it? You figure out what the seller wants and you figure out how you offer them that without sacrificing what I've said a million times on this already, long-term cash flow and fixed rate debt. So you're looking for cash flow. They're looking to get rid of an asset under a certain set of terms. All you have to do is think of that why question and go, or that, sorry, the, the how question. And you go, how would I answer their questions without sacrificing what I need, which is a cash flowing asset? Fun thing with real estate is the appreciation and the increase in income, those all take care of themselves over time through good management. Now you go to the stabilization. Okay, we well, need to keep the building fully occupied. You need to be slightly under market rent as the target. You get way less move outs and vacancy is expensive. So how do I offer a slightly better product than my neighbors at a slightly lower price? People who go bust over improve. And now you have an asset where you've put too much money in and you're not going to get a return. It just needs to be better than everything around it. Or they'll overcharge rent and they'll tax themselves on vacancy. You need to figure out a model where it's like, hey, someone can live here for 50 to $100 less than they could at the property down the street and... If, if you're talking entry-level housing, let's say we have the same flooring, the same cabinets, uh, the same paint colors. I'm like, I'm just going to have like 
I'm gonna have stainless steel appliances then. Like I'm gonna do one thing nicer in theirs. Or if they're if like they have a great property, but it's like they really need to swap out the windows. I'm like, I'm gonna have brand new windows on my property. Now my property is better. It's not way better, but you're like, I like this place better. And then you look at the cost, you're like, it costs less. Of course, everyone's going to live at my place first. That's what a stable property is though. It's at or near market rent. It's at or near full occupancy. And if you can hold those and you wrote a deal that cash flows, like ta-da, you're done. It's that simple. Yeah. What what do you think is a question that people starting out don't ask often enough? So I mean you you've you have over a thousand students. What are some questions that you think like if you were just asking this question, then it would unlock so much more for you. Um, cliche, super true. Um, people do not spend enough time on why am I doing this and what is it going to cost? The clarity of goal is the thing that like, it, I will know if someone calls me and says like, Hey, should I take your course? I can tell you yes or no based on uh, what do you want to get out of it? Mm. People, like people, A lot of people, and it's usually younger. It, it's usually younger males who, who have this. I want to own my time and I want financial freedom. I'm like, awesome. You will not succeed. <laughs> um, uh, the people who call and they go, hey, I, I want to retire my wife or hey, um, my family struggled for, for two generations with money. And if I can generate $10,000 a month, I can take care of my mom and I can take care of myself. Someone who says that, I'm like, okay, what timeline do you want to do that in? They're like, well, it's pretty immediate, but I'd be happy to do that in five years. This is just an example. This, I had this phone call like two days ago with someone. I'm like, okay, have you bought real estate before? That's a good indicator. Um, he's like, I have bought one single family house. I ended up selling it. I'm like, okay, so you know you can close a transaction. That's a hurdle for people. But the question that people aren't asking is why am I doing what I'm doing? And you can hear it immediately when you go, what is the goal? The significance behind that goal is heard immediately when they start with my family, my objectives, even people who are like, I wanted to travel the world my whole life and I've only made it to like two countries. Mm. They're like, I'm like, they can articulate. This is what it looks like when I hit my goal. And it comes through in their description of what they're trying to do. Mm. They're the people who've sat down and said, why am I doing this? If your answer is I want more money, there's a million ways to make money. You will give up on this and probably everything else that you start. If you haven't clarified that. So it's cliche. I'm pretty sure everyone says that on every podcast, but how clearly you have defined in your mind the why and what is significant about getting there will 110% determine your outcomes. Mm. The other thing that I think people should ask themselves is, am I willing to be obsessed? Mm. Everyone that you see online who's hyper successful in one thing probably lacks on a million other things. It's not like anyone's like, for the most part, right? no one's like, just more awesome than everyone else. They're just usually just less well-rounded. <laughs> um, yeah, if you're yeah. insane in one thing, it's because you got obsessed there. So right. if your goal is to be insane at one thing, uh, you need to realize one is going to come at the cost of other things. And you have to accept like, if I'm really going to compete at this, this is what I'm going to be the best at. Like there are no athletes that you see who are just like, you know, I do this thing part-time and I'm pretty good at it. Like they spend all their time doing it. It's a huge dedication. You don't see business owners who are like, uh, like like hyper successful ones. Like, hey, I dabble in a little bit of everything. It's like they are locked in and they're good at that. And they're probably really bad at other stuff. And they've identified uh, that thing that they're good at. A they lot. identify it and they, and they just focus in. So they're basic concepts, but it's like you need to understand why you're doing what you're doing. And if you want to be successful, you need to allow yourself to be obsessed with that thing. Yeah. Well, it's like that statistic. If you write down your goals, you're 70% more likely to achieve them or whatever it is. Like, it's not the actual, like, writing something out, in my opinion. It's not the yeah. actually, like, oh, you picked up a pen and hit paper and there's something magical about that that results in you achieving your goals. I think it's because when people write down their goals, it forces them to articulate what they're actually looking for and to process it. It's like oftentimes like letting people have a, you know, lethargic moment where they're just like sharing their thoughts and letting that like listening to themselves speak and letting that be how it's processed. It's like you just adding structure to what you're going for and letting that be the rubric by which you operate your life so that you can get closer to that thing is all you actually need to get there. It's just like the constant obsession. Like that's also my my theory on why 
you know, manifestation, this idea of just like speaking things into existence increases probability to get there. What I think, so I don't know very much about any of the stuff that I don't know about, obviously, but I speculate that it's just you regularly vocalizing your goals and letting that be the North Star that you gauge everything by and that you decide what decisions to make by is what's actually going to get you there. Like you regularly saying, I want to move to Texas. I want to move to Texas. You're thinking about Texas. You're looking at properties in Texas. You're evaluating what it would be like to move to Texas. When somebody offers, if you want to stay at their place in Tennessee and buy a property and move there, you say no because you're thinking about Texas. Like You're actually making decisions in your life based on this goal that you regularly think about. And it's that constant course correction towards the goal off in the distance that actually gets you there. Yeah, no, and that's exactly it. It's you make oh god, I saw this statistic forever ago, so I, I don't remember what it is. So it, 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 thousands of decisions that you make in the course of a day. Like there's so many decisions that get made, and if your decisions aren't leading you anywhere, you're just going to kind of make random decisions and end up wherever you end up. If you're like I have a target and this is where I am headed, every decision is suddenly very very clear and everything moves you closer. Like. There is no magic. Some people brand it as like, oh, you just manifest everything. Like you, you think it, it'll happen. It's like, I mean, that's not how it works, but it works because you're making, instead of making a thousand decisions going nowhere, you're making a thousand decisions going towards something every single day. And all of a sudden, you know, over the course of a year, you have hundreds of thousands of decisions that have been based off of one outcome. Uh, that outcome almost always happens. Right. Because it has to. You take your your options and suddenly when you make them in your mind an obligation, it's like, oh, well, I have to hit it. So it just has to happen. Like there's, I don't know. That's how things are for me. Maybe I'm just crazy. Um, that's possible too. But yeah. in my mind, the things of like, I've accepted, I'm buying this house in Texas. Like it, it's happening. And there was a point where I had lower liquidity than I wanted. Like there's been a couple of points where I'm like, oh my gosh, I have all this real estate. Interest rates are high. I can't pull the money out. I'm like, I don't know how the heck I'm going to do this. But then the next day I make a thousand you know, little decisions that get me closer to getting there. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, all I had to do was sell this one property. And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I'm there. Ta-da, problem solved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the things come together with it's like, for the most part, yeah, everyone has the pieces to do anything. There's a lot of opportunity, especially in this country, but there's a lot of opportunity to do a lot of things. I think a lot of people just need more time on what is it that I'm actually trying to do? Because if you know what it is and it becomes an obligation to get it done, people generally get it done. One of my favorite quotes is, your brain will search for any of the answers you ask for, so make sure you ask yourself magnificent questions. And that was Paul. There Morris. we go. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly, exactly right. Your outputs will be determined by your inputs. Mm. Yeah. And so like, if, if you want a certain outcome, you need to be asking the right questions. Yeah. And that, that goes for anything. Even if you're saying like, why do I suck? Why do I suck so bad? Why am I so bad at this thing? Or why am I so bad with people? Or why do I suck at numbers? Like your brain's going to give you an answer, whether you actually suck at those things or not, it's going to generate something for you. So if instead yep. you say like, oh, you know, how do I acquire this property? How do I get better at running numbers? How do I get better at talking to people? How do I get better at all these things? Um, yeah, your brain will will give you an answer. Speaking of talking to people, what I I love this. I heard you say it um, when I I came across one of your pieces of content around one of your super practical techniques of calling landowners and saying, hey. I'm just trying to learn and, and get into the space and then building that relationship. Can you share a bit about that strategy for people who are like, they have no idea what to do. They have no money, no knowledge on how this game is played other than this podcast. And then they dive in through the, the technique that you mentioned. For the most part, everything that you want to do, someone else has done. Generally speaking, especially in business, uh, everything you want to do, someone else has done. The best person to teach you how to do something is someone who's already mastered it. So the basic theory, which is, a, I think, the most common sense thing in the world, is if I want to be the best real estate investor I can be, I need to meet with people in my market who've done what I want to do and ask them how they did it. Like, that seems like a sensible step. Because that cuts out all the... That cuts down on your stupid tax a lot. If you can just talk to someone who's already paid the tax and say, how did you handle this? Uh, congratulations, you've removed a lot of stupid tax. So... If you don't know how to do something or you haven't mastered it, talk to the people who've mastered it. That seems logical to me. I don't know why more people don't do it. 
Uh, what I found is that when you meet with them and you ask them, how do you do this? You communicate who you are and where you're at. So like, hey, I'm Christian. I have bought two duplexes. I am out of money. You have a 20 unit building. I have never bought that. How did you get to there? And you, you just let them talk. You map out who you are and you communicate it in like 45 seconds. The rest of the thing is you just learn how they built it. You get a ton of takeaways. They usually give you other connections in the market, property managers, other owners, lawyers, whatever. Um, so they're going to help frame your strategy. Those are the people who usually call me and go, hey, I, I'm not going to buy this. It's too small for me or this doesn't fit what I'm trying to do. But you mentioned you're low on capital. You should check out this. They would absolutely carry a contract on this. And that's why it's like we can do so many of these deals because everyone knows from my 45 second, here's what I'm trying to do. Tell me how you did it. Everyone knows what I'm trying to do and they know my position. <laughs> it's actually this simple. So I see people do like hundreds of calls a day to try to find a deal outside of one property, which I did ask like, just straight up. I'm like, would you be open to selling this? Um, I've only asked one time ever for someone to sell a property to me. Mm. Everything else has come in from like, I've had an actual relationship and that relationship has said, you should look at this or you should buy my property. And this is what I'm looking for. And then we structure to that. I'm not looking for deals and I'm not looking for sellers. I'm looking for how people get to where they're at. And in doing that, I make usually one call a day and I'm not making it today. So I'll have to make it tomorrow. Um, but like during the work week, I make like five, five to 10 calls in a week. And they're about two minute calls asking people like, Hey, here's where I'm at. I'd like to get started. They're owners of my market. And of course the year, if you do this once a weekend, You'll get coffee with 52 owners in your market and all of them will know exactly who you are, where you're starting from and where you're trying to get. And if you actually do have that goal we've talked about, people buy into good goals. Like mm. it sticks with people. If I'm like, hey, my wife got injured as a teacher and our politics are crazy, which I don't think anyone here disagrees with. So people are like, oh yeah, no, school school districts are crazy. We We, we get this. You're trying to retire your wife. I want to help you retire your wife. Like there's, there's automatic buy-in cause it's relatable. Um, and it's not a strategy. I'm not trying to get something from them. Right. It's an authentic, like I'm trying to learn and I'm interested in what you did. The whole rest of the conversation, you're talking to them, you're learning from them. How did you get from point A to point B? You go, you go in with an objective of learning. You walk away with takeaways. Those people are the ones who call you and say, you need to look at this deal. You should try doing this. That is all the deal flow. Other than, you know, occasionally a broker will call us, which which happens when you're active. But like getting started, meet with 52 people and have them care. Mm. Like legitimately just have some interest in what you're trying to accomplish and they will take you all the way there. And that's how we went so fast. We went from like, I went to four units to over 200 multifamily units in two years because I met with, you know, I'm probably, I'm going to say safely north of 100 owners. But I met with, we'll say a hundred people who just care a little bit about moving me forward. And I learned a lot from. And so we got to take all of a hundred people's 50 years of knowledge and condense it in two years. And that is how you, I think anyone would be successful doing literally anything. This isn't a real estate strategy. This is a like, how do you do anything? You find the people who've done it and then you learn what they did and you communicate what you're trying to do. I mean, it's like, yeah. There is not a more 101 answer that you can possibly have. It's super basic, which is why it works. Yeah. We are herd animals. We succeed based on how badly the herd wants us to succeed. I always say your success in life can be directly correlated to the quality and quantity of people who want you to succeed. Like if people at the top want you to win, you're going to win. Like period, especially in real estate. It's such a relationship based business. If you call people and you have the humility to say, Hey, I don't know everything and I respect what you know and have done and this is where I am and some of my goals and you win them over, then your chances of success in doing that thing that they've done increase dramatically. Not only that, but to like to to have that humility, you only have a certain window of time when you can ask the stupid questions. Like you eventually get to the point where you can't ask the stupid questions. So to start the conversation with saying, hey, I don't know everything and I'm going to ask you like I'm I'm willing to to be vulnerable and humble and and ask you some stupid questions. It's like everybody has in that life that person that they know and they're moderately close to but they're not close enough to know their name but they're too close to be able to ask their name. And you're like, "Oh, that's that one guy. <laughs> I can't remember his name, but it's too late to ask." You know, like you have that window yep. of time that you can actually say, "Hey, 
I don't know everything. You've done something I haven't done, and I'd love to learn from you. I really respect what you've done and where you come from. What are your thoughts? And, and, and people respond really well to that. Final thing that I really want to share in, in relation to this, buy-in is really important. And if you're in business, they're, they're really everything at the end of the day comes down to sales and marketing. Like sales and marketing is like the backbone of every business. You, if you're trying to build relationships and you're trying to move forward, at some point you end up organically building a personal brand. I think entrepreneurs need to hear this. It is really like ludicrously important to call your shot when you are starting. Mm. Um, if you think of any great sporting event, you think of any great achievement, it is so much sexier when you go, I'm going to do this thing. And then you do it because people look back and they're like, oh my gosh, I remember three years ago when this person said this was going to happen. And it did. You look like a hero and people remember. I had a sales conference. This is at the co-star group. One of the new, uh, her, her name's Jamie. Uh, she was a new sales rep. She just moved, uh, from a support role to a sales role. And we had this competition with 300 sales reps doing a 300 slide deck presentation over three days. So this huge competition and the winning team gets a ludicrous amount of money. Like we're talking like deep six figure payouts. I mean, this is like a competition that matters. Day one, they do this B reel at the beginning of uh, every morning. I'm like, oh, here's how the event's been so far. First day she comes in here. I am winning this thing, calling my shot. And it was like funny and it was like, it was memorable. Um, she won the thing and it was memorable. And I still remember that to this day. And she's one of the highest level execs in that company now. Mm. Um, I don't think that would have happened if she didn't just call her shot. Mm -hmm. If she failed, no one would have cared or remembered. I would not remember that she said, I'm going to win this two years later. If she didn't win, there's no cost at all to calling your shot and missing. It is the coolest thing in the world when you do that. And that gets remembered. Um, so this is just a reminder for people, like when you have done all the steps we talked about here, you've mapped your goal, you've defined significance behind it, you've communicated to others what you're doing, you need to tell the people around you, like, I'm committed to doing this and this is going to happen. Because that is how you move things from being an option or something that's written down on a napkin to like, I have an obligation to do this now. Like I've committed to myself and then I've committed to other people. Like this is what is going to happen. There is no cost for missing other than, you know, your pride. Um, but no one will remember the amount of distance you can cover when you do something fantastic and you're like, I was going to do this. And then you go do it is the best single thing that can happen to your business as far as momentum. So that will be my closing thing. If you are starting and you have done the prior steps that we've discussed, go tell your immediate network or your Instagram or YouTube channel, whatever, just go announce like this is going to happen. It's one of my favorite things Cody and I did. You can go back to our YouTube channel. I'm going to plug out one more time. Cody and Christian Multifamily Strategy. You can go to the first videos. It used to be Cody's YouTube channel. It had 20 subscribers when I joined. Before Cody bought a piece of real estate, it is him talking about, I'm going to buy real estate. And we kept those videos on there. You can see they're like two minute videos. 19-year-old uh, Cody being like, I'm going to buy this. And you see like 10 videos in, I joined the channel. And I'm like, I own a duplex. And we're going to take out this 38 unit building. And we did. Some people know who we are now. Like we get, we get to go speak and get to talk and like our business has flourished. And it's cool to go back to the beginning and say, this was way before I'm successful. I publicly called my shot and I can point all the way back to like, look, anyone can do this because I was a nobody in a cheap suit jacket in a basement of a building with Cody saying, we're going to make this happen. And we made it everything happen and more. It's just so much cooler. So I'm going to stop beating a dead horse here, but it's like, seriously, if you're new, set your goal, call your shot and then go hit it. And if you do that series of things, you now have a brand and a company that is going to go somewhere. And when you call your shot, you're giving people the opportunity to participate and contribute in your success. Some of the most meaningful relationships that I have in real estate right now are literally just for me, like, the second I saw the quad was ripping with short term rentals, I said, I'm going to buy a hotel. I told everybody I knew, like, oh, I'm going to buy a hotel and I'm going to own 100 units over the next 24 months. And then people saying like, oh, I didn't realize you were going for that. I actually know a guy who invests in boutique hotels. Let me connect you. And it was like this domino effect of people who want me to win in life anyway, who are totally unrelated to the work that I'm doing, just coming together and being able to participate and saying, oh, I really like that shot that you're shooting for here let me help out and letting the community of again like us herd animals letting the herd actually contribute to build something cool together and then now they get to participate in my journey and say oh 
yeah, you uh, like yeah, like I, I contributed to Gideon in this way or in that way. And it's it's really meaningful. It also makes the journey a lot more special to be able to share it with people instead of just building something in isolation. Absolutely agree. One one hundred percent. That is uh get, get you get a lot of buy in when you can do that. And then everything gets a little bit easier when you know, as you progress, you, you establish yourself. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that's a, that's been the keys for success for me was was clarity of goal, intentionality of achieving it, and then involving as many people as possible in the journey. And yeah, you want to do you want to be successful, do those things. Um, that that is universal. That is not real estate advice. That is everything advice. A hundred percent. All right. To wrap this up, when you hear the word incredible, what comes to mind? I immediately think people achieving impossible things. Like I, I, any time where I'm like, oh my gosh, that's incredible. It's when I see something where I'm like, I didn't realize you could do that. And I see a lot of people do that. I, I'm obsessed with business in general, beyond real estate. I'm obsessed with business, but it's the people who do something where it's like, it was so, it, it's usually things that seem like it, it'd be obvious. I'm like, I didn't know you could do that. And it seems so obvious now. Mm. Take like a, like, like an Elon Musk where it's like, oh yeah. How about a rocket that just like comes back down and lands itself so you can reuse it. It's like. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Great idea. Like, uh, should have been implemented. Yeah. Genius. Electric vehicles can be sexy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like, <laughs> of course those would have ridiculous acceleration. Have you ever seen a, like, toy car? Yeah. Um, these things can be insane. They can now perform uh, gas. It's like, oh, yeah. Like, those things are, when I think incredible, that is what I think. Making the impossible obvious. Mm, I like that. That's good. Christian, where can people find you? People can find me on Instagram, and I am very responsive there. So if you have a question, ask Christian Osgood. Conveniently, unlike my partner, Cody Davis, I have a unique enough name <laughs> where you will find me with only my name. You look for Cody Davis, you're going to find a, a, a New England football player. Um, so <laughs> at Christian Osgood on Instagram, uh, very active there, and I love sharing the journey. So if anyone has any questions, uh, talk to me there. If you want to learn uh, all the long form of the ins and outs of how we do this, we have a t- ton of videos are free on youtube it's cody and christian multifamily strategy um, and again you can you can ask questions there we'll absolutely answer them but you have questions instagram you want to just go learn a whole bunch of stuff check out youtube one more one more thing if people want to take another level uh, we have multifamily strategy.com we have courses mentorships there's stuff for the next level i, I tell everyone this and I, I really mean it everything is free on youtube YouTube algorithm does not push everything that people should know. <laughs> so course of mentorship, there are things that we do with our time that will make this go faster for you. You can check those out. Everything that we know is for free. So if you want, if you're interested, check out YouTube and Instagram. If you want to take it to the next level, uh, check out that website. I have a lot of free resources on there as well. Awesome. Christian, thank you so much. It's been a great time. Absolutely. Absolutely.